All right, get ready for an electrifying episode of the Michael Geeky podcast featuring Fino Dreamers, an exotic mushroom cultivator who's making waves by growing everything but cubes. In just under a year, his all-in, no-expense-spared approach has earned him fast results and a big reputation in the mushroom community. Tune in as we explore his obsession with the more elusive species like Pan Cyan's, Zaps, and Tamps, and dive into what drives this new breed of motivated, boundary-pushing cultivator. Whether you're a seasoned grower or just getting started, you won't want to miss this look into the future of mushroom cultivation. <laughs> Yo, welcome to the Myco Geeky Podcast, where we explore the fascinating world of mushrooms and the people who love them. From expert cultivators to passionate foragers, we bring you deep conversations, cutting edge insights, and everything mycology. Whether you're a seasoned mycophile or just curious, we invite you to geek out with us on the wonders of fungi and join the mushroom movement. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Myco Geeky Podcast, the podcast that goes deep so you can level up your at-home mushroom cultivation game. I'm your host, Myco Geeky, and we got a great show for you tonight. We're going to sit down with the one and only Fino Dreamers. We're going to talk exotics. We're going to talk about how this guy in like a, a year flat is, is killing it, is knocking it out of the park, getting attention of a lot of people, um, killing it on Instagram. Uh, representing on Spore Swaps, and we're going to get into it with them. Uh, first, let me shout out the Patreon supporters. Not not lying, guys. A lot of you guys, uh, you know, every every Monday night you show up, you're ready for the show. Um, it costs money, it costs time and energy, uh, and my Patreon supporters are the ones who are keeping it going for, for everybody. So thank you guys, love you guys, appreciate it. When I get back... Uh, from Nama, we're 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 going full tilt boogie on Patreon, and we're we're gonna get some some cool stuff on uh, kind of rolling. So anyway, stay tuned for that. Uh, and then I got to shout out my buddy Stealthy Spores. Twenty twenty four summer decks available. Stealthyspores.com. Use promo code Geeky to get ten percent off. And uh, that little kickback that I get for that that I'm not even seeing it. It's going straight to the Myco Mamas and their Mycelium Revolution. Um, so yeah. You know, we're, we're just, we're trying to do our part. We're trying to keep the mycelium myceliating. We're trying to keep the spores germinating. We're trying to keep the fruit fruiting over here. So uh, you got to give back. That's what we're doing. Anyway, so tonight, the, the most important thing we're doing right now uh, is getting right into it. We're going to be talking to um, a guy who kind of reminds me in a lot of ways of uh, natural state mycology. Um, just lickety split, you blink and... He just showed up and knocked it out of the park and is doing a lot of great things. And so having him on, I really wanted to uncover what's he doing differently? Uh, what's his approach? Well, why is this working for this guy? So I, I think we did that. So let's uh, let's go check in with him and let's find out all about Fino Dreamers. All right. Welcome to the show. The one and only Fino Dreamers. What's up, man? What's happening? You know, it's uh, what is it? It's Wednesday night, not not to the viewers tonight, it's Monday night, but we're recording this Wednesday night, it's late, we both had a bunch of crap going on today, we're tired, but but it's okay, we're, we're, we're pheno dreaming right now, and then we're going to go to bed and we're going to pheno dream some more, so, so it's all good. That's right. If anything can keep me up, it's talking about fucking mushrooms, I'm going to tell you that right now, so <laughs> that's what we're doing. All right, man, so you know the deal? Uh, first things first, let, let's get your first mushroom memory, the earliest early memory of mushrooms for you, followed by um, like your Michael origin story, how you really got into growing mushrooms. Um, well, my first mushroom memory was actually, it was terrible, <laughs> to be honest <laughs> with you. Um, <laughs> my uh, my cousin introduced them to me. He's like, hey, let's, you know, let's do this. And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? And um, I had just, I got in some trouble, some legal trouble, and I was just starting a uh, probation, and um, my PO was just an absolute nightmare, and so I was just in a really bad, like, mental headspace, and I didn't know that going into a trip with something like that would just eat you alive, and that's exactly what they did. It was just, it was just an awful trip, super bad time. I 
thought the cops were after me. It was just terrible. And I tried it again after that. Of course I had to, and it was terrific every time after that, you know, but yeah, that, that first memory was a terrible memory. <laughs> well, Hey, you got back on the horse. That's what matters. Yeah. And, and, and the, Hey, you got it out of the way. You, you, you got the, the bad, bad trip out of the way rather than going, man, they're all good. When is this bad trip going to come? That's, that's fine. <laughs> All right, so how about uh, kind of Michael origin story? How'd you get into uh, going like gangbusters here, growing mushrooms? Um, well, I started small. Um, I found uh, I found Goro Tech on um, what was it on YouTube? I just I was bored one day, just sitting on the couch. I was like, you know what? I should grow mushrooms. Let's figure out what this is all about. And uh, I found Goro Tech, and he did the, the Pan Cyan TTBVI. And he had all the information on there. And I was like, you know what? I'll double the tent like what he did. And I did all that. And he's like, hey, you guys can even message me. And I give away free spores. And so I did that. And he, like, the whole video basically got me all started with agar and a tent, exotics. I, I grew Pan Cyan's, like, right off the bat. Um it was really exciting and that's that's kind of where it all started and began to unfold that's a new one for me man okay so out of the gate pan science but you know what i get it that that those gordo tech write-ups they're so well done it's step by step you're like okay it's all i gotta do is follow the directions here yeah so, so wow okay so ttbvi that was uh about a year ago is that right yeah, I think it was um, last year, uh, last fall at some point I started that, yeah. Nice. All right, so y you followed that tech, you you built his tent, and you got fruit, right? Yeah, I got a lot of them because I, I think I did like eight trays right off the bat. Nice. I, asked, I didn't know what to do with them. <laughs> so, all right, so so talk to me about this. You You had had some some experiences with cubes but you're as like a real real cultivator in your basement where you belong as an at-home cultivator so i i i see the floorboards above you um now you got you got some pan cyans and i'm i'm assuming you you enjoyed the fruits of your labor how was that uh how was that experience compared to cubes for you um well i think the first time i did cubes I, I don't i don't even know how much i took but it was enough it was enough that's for sure but the pan cyan's it was it's really mind-blowing I, I you take like half a gram and you know a gram if you're really feeling ballsy and it's that's way that's definitely enough so it's yeah. it's crazy but they were it was really smooth like i couldn't i couldn't have a bad trip if i wanted to have a bad trip and the pan cyans. Um, and that's why I like them. Like I won't, I won't even eat cubes anymore. It's that's just the whole thing. If I'm going to, if it's usually pan cyans, if I'm going to have anything. I like it. Yeah. Smooth. That's kind of the word I, I like using to describe it. And the, the, the come up is, is smoother. Yeah. It's just everything about it. It's, I don't know. I, I say I, I'm 48. So I say it's like a, it, it, it's better for us older older people to to do pans than you know who knows i can't do acid anymore i can't do all that stuff i, wow. I gotta have i gotta have me a smooth you know like a smooth cognac followed by a smooth pan cyan dose <laughs> yeah i hear yeah. you i mean i i still like i still like cubes but i i, I agree the pans got a little something special going on for sure yeah. all right so <clears throat> so out of the gate yeah, I mean, you didn't fart around. And I think this is important to highlight for people watching because a lot of people are going, and I've had a hundred and probably maybe hundreds of people who have hopped in my DMs, want to start growing mushrooms. And the gist of what they're always trying to figure out is what's the cheapest, easiest way I can get fruit. Yeah, speed. It, speed is it, my big one. That's a question. Speed yeah. Helps. Like, yeah, how fast, but also how cheaply can I do it? Like, do yeah. I have to buy a Presto? Do I have to get this? What do I have to get? And you didn't do that. You you saw a tech, you followed it, 
you you liked it you you went for it i think this is important to highlight because i think this follows through for you for this whole past year you are not afraid to build some shit to try some shit to to spend a couple dollars to try to do it right you're not trying to half ass it out of the gate you're trying to whole ass it every time that's okay. that's what i what i see yeah where where's that come from? Because that's that's against the grain. That's not how most people are. Most people go, uh, too much work. How can I do it easier? Do I really have to do that? <laughs> and you didn't do that. I think it's more so like when I find something that I'm interested in, like a new hobby, I go all in. I will drop whatever amount of money. I just get like super balls deep in it, and I want to get the best of everything, and I want to do everything and. That's how it always is. Like I started, I got into saltwater aquariums and I started buying like the best equipment of everything right off the bat. And it was, it was getting so ridiculous to the point where I had to stop and look at it. And I'd never even set the aquarium up. I stopped because I was looking at how much money I was spending. Right. Like it was just crazy, but that's how it is with every hobby that I get into. I wish I didn't understand that. I wish I couldn't relate to that. I'd have a lot more money in my bank account for sure if if that wasn't me, but that's how I am too, man. I can't, if I'm going to do it, I can't, I can't do it cheaply. I got to go, well, the, what, are, what are the right people doing? I want to do what those guys are doing. Right. Usually means spending money. <clears throat> well, I think that's an important thing for people to think about because there's a lot of people like us who go all in, want to do it right. But I'll, I'll tell you, here's the difference. A lot of these guys will spend the money and they'll sit on this stuff. I've, I've had people tell me they've sat on gear and genetics for years before they actually ran their first tubs. Yeah. You don't seem to be afraid to, I mean, you, you acquired knowledge, you acquired the tech and you go, go, let's do this. Well, I, I actually, that's cool. I did sit on the exotics for a while. Yeah. I grew the pants I and then, and then I started, I got on Instagram and I started seeing all these crazy cube grows. Like I didn't, when you look up, you know, Cubensis, you're, you're not seeing like the mutants and like right. all this crazy stuff. So then my mind was blown on the cube. So then I started running a ton of cubes. I think I have like 500 different varieties of cubes and I bought all those within like a few months. <laughs> so then I started sure. running those and then I found, um, I found uh, Michael Capo on spore swaps and he had the exotic species and I'm like, what the hell are these? I don't even know what these are. So I started looking those up and then I, I started buying a bunch of exotics and I, I was scared to run them at first. And I did sit on them for quite a while. Cause I was just scared of failure. And I don't, I don't know why I'm like, and then one day I was like, well, if I don't run these, I'm never going to run them. So now when was that? Was that after the TTBVI success? Was that? Yeah. So you did the TTBVI, you start running some weirdo cubes. Yeah. And then at some, and see you're a junkie, dude. You're out of the gate. You're a total junkie. You got, you, you, <laughs> you started difficult. Do you know how many cube growers have been growing cubes for 20 years and still won't touch pans? And you, you started with pans. Then you went with the weirdo cubes. And then, and then finally... You said this is not enough. I got I it's gotta be harder and more difficult. It's like put yeah. another plate, put another plate on the, the bench. We we gotta go harder. <laughs> yes. I like that. That's cool, man. I mean, one year. You've been doing this one year. You're like, it's like I had natural state mycology on and he was crossing and breeding mushrooms in a year, and he got a lot of people were like, This guy, who's this guy? And I'm like, who this guy is, is somebody who was about it from day one, took it real seriously. And you're, you're, you're exactly like that for, for exotics, man. I, I, I think it's very cool. Yeah, definitely. So let's do this. Let's take a break from some of these questions and let's show the viewers. I want everybody to see your basement. I, uh, I, I, Absolutely. I'm in awe. I got the same ductwork and plenum running down the length of my, my basement as well. Okay. Only I only have one little corner. Um, let, let, let's show everybody what, what your basement's looking like these days. 
All right. So walk us through what we got here. Um, so this is, so I have half the basement and this is the entryway to my half. So, you know, I got some, uh, room temperature species on the left. I got a little DIY, um, range that I built out of spare parts from, uh, habitat for me, for humanity. So I built that stove down there. So I cook grain in the basement. Um, now did then, you, is that electric or did you pipe in some gas down there? No, I ran gas. Nice. Yeah, That's so what I'm, I'm thinking about doing that too. Although I got, I'm gonna run that flex pipe because I got to run it a good thirty feet, and I. That's hate, exactly what I did. Flex, yes. yeah. That's what I got to do. Okay. All right. So slide one. Yeah, now yeah. this is from a little bit further back. I'm yeah. So. Figure. Yeah, yeah, so now that's the door, and then now is this from the yeah, door, so but angled another way? Okay. This is this is to the left, if you take a left from the last picture, and then I'm facing to the yeah. right. Okay. I'm yeah. That. There's a stove there on the right. And then so I got my cold chamber on the left. I got my grain tent after that on the left, and then my warm species tent on the left after that. And then All that right. back, now, back now what? Hold on, hold on. I'm seeing this little hose snaked up above your ductwork here. Um, please tell me that you're you're bringing in fresh air directly from outside. Actually, that's the vent for the rain hood. Oh, uh, the vent for the rain hood. Okay. Which does not even work that well. <laughs> okay. Okay. All, right. All right. So then this is now further down. Yeah, so that's that's facing the opposite way. So the last picture, this would be the end of it. I just kind of got like my uh, usually the table to the left. There's where I kind of prep stuff up, mix agar, or, you know, liquid culture, yeah. whatever. Nice. So for the culture hooker, there's my cold chamber. Wait, say that one again. What did you just say? That one's my cold fruiting chamber, my walk-in cooler. Oh sure. Your cold fruiting chamber, because we all have that a year in. <laughs> wow. All right, so we're we're gonna we're gonna touch on this some more, but I like it. This looks like you did it all right. It looks like you got a bunch of two inch foam board. You got some gypsum. I'm imagining you sealed that up all real good. And yeah. uh, what you got an air conditioner running in there? Or what's cooling it? Yeah, that's an air conditioner. I just have kind of uh, tricked out. Okay. Cool. Okay, we'll get we'll get into that a little bit later. All right, and then now here's the the, the real business end. I see the flow hood in the distance there. Yeah. So there's to the left are my room temp species and the entryway, and then to the right, yeah, that's my lab. The nice. flow hood. All right. So now your your chambers, and we're gonna get into the dreamer tubs and all that. But I saw you had at least one tent, but you got these tubs dialed in to adjust, you know, humidity, temperature, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I am, it seems like you have little trays or tubs or bags like cut off. Is that the idea where they're, these are little micro chambers where you're controlling the, the growing conditions, correct? Right. Yeah. So the, okay. the bags cut off in there. I just use sometimes if I run out of shoe boxes, I'll just grab right. a grow bag and use that as a tray instead. All right. So that's what that is. Nice. All right. Now, so what we got the still air box pop up still air box here for? What are you so, doing there? Well, that, um, that actually I'm working on a collapsible fruiting chamber. Oh, cool. So okay. Coming up with some ideas for that. And I bought quite a bit of still air boxes online trying to grab like an idea to go off of because I mm -hmm. want to make the shipping price cheap on it. Because right now my dreamer tubs cost a fortune to ship. So if I can make yeah. them collapsible, I'll save a lot of money and um, I'll be able to sell them at a more affordable price to people. Right. Yeah, dude, back in the day, I was like, man, I'd love to come up with a way to to get get flow hoods in more people's hands uh, without them having to build it. And there was always the issue of once I built it, it was just so big that the shipping became cost prohibitive. So yep. I hope you figure it out. 
I gave up. I was like, yeah, it's too much work. I can't do this. I don't got, I don't got time for it. So great. Fino dreamers is gonna, he's gonna have the ultimate dream, figure it out. And, and all the growers are going to benefit. I like it. All right. Now I got a question. You got this section here. Why you do a race platform in this section? That was actually, um, the floor was here. Oh, day. that was there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. And out of pure laziness, I never got rid of it. Sure. When I should have, cause it's porous. It's who knows right. what's under it. You know? Tell you what, man, I don't, you look like you're in a similar basement to mine. Um, I'd love to tell you that I, I bleach my floors once a week and then I thoroughly wipe everything down once a week, but I don't, <laughs> I, I wipe my table down. Anything that sterile shit needs to be in contact with, it gets clean for sure. But like the general environment that gets clean maybe once a month. So you're, you're good. You haven't had any massive contamination outbreaks from that plywood, right? No, I bleached the floor, but underneath who knows? Yeah. yeah. I'm Just probably not with you. I, I want to do it once a week, but really it's not yeah. that often. <laughs> it's it's when I look and go, oh, this is gross. I guess I gotta fix this. Yeah. <laughs> it's usually when I do it. All right. And then you got I like you got your uh your Facebook marketplace snapple fridge find i'm assuming that's Very actually cool. another uh, habitat for humanity oh so, no way nice yeah i get all kinds of jackpot scores there all the time dang man i gotta start going to habitat for humanity no i don't have room for that one that one's that one's looking pretty big all right so uh so guys just let's just let's recap here year one <laughs> Half the basement. He's got a cold fruiting chamber. He's got a, a room temperature or roughly room temperature fruiting chamber. He's got the lab. He, he's got a, a grain bag and a substrate prep station, refrigerator, all that stuff. Habitat for, for humanity. Go check it out. You never know what you can find there. Um, but you got to, you know, get a lab together. If, if you're not trying to buy LC and uh, all in one grow bags and you're trying to do cultivation, you got to have a space. You just, just got to get a space. If you live in New York City and upstate or, or in like Manhattan or something like that and you just don't have the space, then everything you buy has got to be collapsible, put awayable, pull outable. You know, your kitchen table turns into your, your lab temporarily. Um, but if you're from the Midwest, like Fino Dreamers, myself, uh, you probably got a basement. It makes sense to go out some space in the basement and get some going. All right. So let's move on. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, so, so we got just barely into, all right, I grew, grew some pan cyans. I grew some weirdo cubes. I started collecting all these uh, exotic spore prints and whatnot. And, and finally you made the leap. What was it? Was there a moment? Can you like put your, your finger on exactly what it was that got you to go, okay, I'm just screw it. I'm doing it. I'm going to start trying some of these other weird things. Um, I think I owe a lot of credit to, I have a really good friend on the shroomery um, wavy edge. I, I want to say I owe a lot of credit for him kind of pushing me to kind of, hey, get this shit going, you know, already. Because he fruited, he fruited Baocystis and he fruited Neoholopensis. And I'm like, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of getting a little jealous over here. I should actually start trying to do these, <laughs> you right. know. I think, I, I think watching him fruit those is kind of what made me get get it in gear and get going on them man all right neo halopensis i have only seen one fruit picture of indoor cultivated lab cultivated neo halopensis i did not know he yeah that's wavy uh, yet maybe i think maybe i haven't seen his post I, I the post i've seen is from somebody down in uh in mexico so i don't know where he's from but he's nice. not from mexico then then I got to go take a look at this because I want to see what these look like. 
I believe he is the first to do them. Yeah, I'm, I know he's the first to do indoor baocystis. So, nice. well, on the shroomery, uh, uh, again, right? You don't. Who knows what? It's like telling a joke. You don't know who actually was the first. At least the first to talk about it somewhere publicly. Yeah. Yes. Which, yeah. Exactly. If you figure out how to grow neohalopensis, why the fuck wouldn't you start telling people? <laughs> right. right? Yeah. Why'd you yeah. do it if not to go, look what I did? Yes, <laughs> yes. exactly. Yeah. All right, man, so, so he got you going. That's cool. Um. So so, what was the first? So when you finally said, okay, I'm going to try some of this harder to grow stuff, what was the first thing you tried to grow? Um. There wasn't, I just started sending... So I totally forgot to mention growing Zapatocorum. I, I did grow Zapatocorum and still sat on all this species. And I grew that before he grew the Neohalopensis and Bayos. Okay. Um, but then once I seen that and I got in gear, there wasn't no one species. It was, I'm sending everything. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, right now I'm sending everything. <laughs> all right. So, so tell me about this intermediate Zapatocorum period. How, how did you approach that first zap grow? And, and approximately when was that? Like how long ago was that? Um, so that was, I want to say January. I put them to substrate. Okay. And so probably November. I probably, I'd imagine I got them on grain. Maybe okay. December. I don't know. Uh, probably a couple months into growing. I, you know, two, three months into growing is okay. when I started started working with them so i got them on substrate um and then i forgot i think maybe february they pinned for me finally and dude they fruited for half a year on that same substrate so i had them for you know literally half the time i've been growing <laughs> all right so so talk me through did you start on wood chips? What grain did you use? Did you just use the, the CV substrate or, or did you like oh, okay, walk me so, through that first decision making process? Um, so my method with, with them was kind of uh, just try to keep it simple, you know. So I did I did core and uh, vermiculite, and that was just core and vermiculite, and I actually did it um just totally raw, unpasteurized, unsterilized, just like that. Because I, I had good success with running cubes like that. If I was using, um, you know, a certain type of cocoa core, I could get away with it. And I did get away with it with the zapped corum as well for half a year. Um, so, yeah, just core. They grow great on core. So you had grain spawn on what grain? What did I did probably whole oats. I was running with I whole was oats. With, okay. Yeah, back then. And you did not pasteurize or sterilize your CV at all. And I didn't. Ran it. I didn't. But since then, I recommend not to do that. Okay. <laughs> but I did get I did get away with it for this quorum, Yes, and for half a year, I got away with it with them. That is impressive. Yeah. So, but now you're you're saying now you do sterilize all your sub. Um, so I did have a really, really, really bad trike problem for a few months between then and now. Um, and everything was just, trike was just kicking my ass. Like there was no tomorrow. My, my agar was good. My grain was good. I was taking grain back to agar to check the grain. It was coming out clean. Everything was good. And so I, I narrowed it down. Well, it's gotta be my substrate. So then I was pasteurizing it. I was getting trike. I was sterilizing it. I was getting trike. And then I found, I was listening to one of your podcasts, actually. And you brought up something about MGP plus. Mm -hmm. And you're like, man, I tell you, I don't get trike. And I'm like, this guy is full of shit. He's, it's got to get. <laughs> I'm, not I'm not fucking with you. Why would I make that up? John doesn't pay me shit. I don't get any money for him selling any of those bags of that stuff. That shit <laughs> fucking works, don't it? It works. It works. Yes, I, got I know. It's it's yeah. My mind was blown, and that's yeah. It, it works. It's crazy. But, now, but so now you do what he says, though. You sterilize the sub because I did have 
when I wasn't sterilizing the sub, what he told me was happening is that if you're not sterilizing the sub, every once in a while there's a little something, something extra in there, and it throws off his blend. And so I was having it where maybe every, one out of 10, one out of 16 bags um, would just get trichoderma hard as fuck. Everything else would be fine, but I still was like, that's too much. So I, I went back to him and was like, what do I got to do, dude? Why am I just getting this one random bag every, you know, decent run I do that gets trichoderma? He goes, are you sterilizing your sub? I go, of course not. Who, who the fuck does that? And he said, we'll start doing that. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't even, I can't hardly remember what that shit looks like anymore. I, yep. I do no, those two things. So when I first got it, I, I used it with tap water and I was still getting trichoderma. Okay. Water's chlorinated. Yeah. So then I, I, I found his video online. It's like, hey, you got to use spring water. Yeah. So I spring water and yeah, it's trike be gone. Just like that. Right. It's crazy. Yeah, I forget. He was telling me he had another guy who I guess did a mat. It was like a bulk grower. He did a massive run and he used all the like tap water oh, and just no. didn't. Yeah. I was like, bro, you got it. That's, that's got to be on the package crystal clear because oh. I, I a lot of people are using tap water. Yeah. Yeah. Not now. I'm 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 nervous. I use distilled water for nearly fucking every possible thing. Agar, hydrating sub, hydrating yeah, I'm about the I'm leaning towards that myself. I've been thinking yeah. about it. Cause why not? Same with why I like popcorn. I just don't I buy Jiffy Pop off the shelf if it's good enough for me to eat. It's probably cleaner than most of the, if I go to somewhere like where people buy food for their horses and their sheep and their goats, it's probably dirty grain. So I, I just, I started doing that cause I can't, I am not a bolt grower. I'm growing for fun. I'm growing for just, just me and a few friends. And so I, I can spend a little bit extra on the popcorn. I guess if I was a bolt grower, I'd probably go back to oats, but yeah. Well, that's cool, man. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that worked out. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, bye bye trichoderma, man. It's such a buzzkill. The trichoderma is such a buzzkill. You put all that work into the grain and and the substrate, and you're like, God damn it! Oh, and I don't know about. Yeah, I don't know about. Sorry, I don't know about you, but man, I, I'm not the type. If I got if I got a little bloom of trichoderma, that all that shit gets thrown out. I don't open it. I don't try to salvage a couple fruits. That just goes bye bye. So, yeah, yeah, I needed to get rid of it. So that's cool. All right. So you did. Uh, so the zaps. Walk me through how you approached humidity with the zaps that first run. Oh. Um... Where did I see it? So there was a guy I was I was watching on the shroomery. It was uh, God, I can't remember his name. Anyways, on Instagram, it's Michael Zapotech. Yeah, he took okay. those amazing Zapotecorum grows, like full he, flushes, he, nails them every time. And so I, you know, I, I I've been watching him way back from you know the shroomery from like a year ago, and he was just soaking the hell out of the substrate. And so I was like, all right, well these guys obviously really like water, so I really. I tested it to see how much water they would tolerate, and it's all of it. They'll tolerate all of it. It's, it's really crazy. So, all right. So, are you? You're not like you're just using a fogger, though, right? You're you're not actually misting. You're right. No, I don't do any misting. Um, not in you know my Dreamer tub setup. So I run. An elite tech humidity controller, I calibrate the humidity to negative 10. Otherwise, the alarm will just go off like crazy and drive you. Oh, yeah. Nuts. yeah. So I calibrate that to negative 10. And then for Zap Decorum, I'll run it at like 95% humidity. So technically 105, but you know, not really. But that's right. what it's, according to the math, it would be 105. Nice. Now, dude, you know those controllers, you can you can open up the back of them. And on the board, there's there's the little emitter that makes the alarm. You can just take a pair of needle nose pliers, wiggle that little fucker right off there. Never, never alarms again. It tries to. There's just no siren or there's no horn for it to do it. And that was like, that was day one because that shit drove me crazy, dude. I kept trying to reprogram that thing. How can I get this thing to not do that? 
Yeah. Was the elite fight? Yep. 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 Yeah. Uh, the Couple. caliber to negative 10 worked fine as well, but right, I did not cool. do that. Yeah, pop them fuckers out. Get rid of them. Never alarms. Yes. And, it, I mean, it first time it happened, I wasn't even home. I just got a text from my wife going, what the fuck is going on in the basement? Come back and turn this. I'm like, okay, this shit's coming out. Pop the back off. Bam, pull that. Got rid of it. Yeah, they're they're obnoxious. Oh man, it's they are obnoxious. Yeah, cool man. So, so you you were just just fogging the shit out of them w- with with no remorse, just keeping it absolutely humid in there. You you weren't trying to dial it back. All all the instincts that a cube grower would have of like not wanting the 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 cake too wet. You gotta you gotta kill that instinct and just. You got to have a soupy little mess down there, right? Yeah, yeah, really wet. And then, you know, I, 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 one day or after one flush, I was like, dude, this is, I don't know why they're not aborting, but let's see what it takes to abort them. So then I, I really just went full bore on it. And they, dude, they weren't dying. And there was like, wow. I had it to the point where like my substrate was literally bobbing in the water. Wow. And it's like, <laughs> they're that they just take it oh shit well you know that makes me think uh one of the places so we just went to mexico this summer and one of the places that we found zaps was there was this little uh road and a very lightly used road probably only by some mule or whatever but on the side were these little irrigation ditches and the cubes were, or the uh, zaps were growing off the side of the irrigation ditch. And the stipes were just covered in muck. And I, as you know, now I don't know, I have not harvested any lab cultivated ones, but in almost all instances, the stipes on the wild found cubes, they're pretty fibrous and firm. Yes. And when, when I found them in that irrigation ditch, I said to myself, Oh, these have been designed by nature to withstand mudslides, floods, all that kind of stuff. So what you're saying makes total sense. They're used to being in places that frequently, when it rains, floods out, and they can withstand that. So they they probably eat that shit up. They probably love it. You know know what's crazy about that, though? Because at the same time, if you touch them the wrong way, they'll abort. If right. you spray them with like a pump sprayer, I know yeah. what the fuck is that all about? I know. Uh, I know. Happy had it where he he had some pins looking real good, a couple inches tall, and but the cake was looking a little dry, so he just missed it everything, and they all aborted. Yeah. Now I'll, my theory is this: that if your cake looks dry and you go to mist them, you're already too late. That the I don't think the misting them necessarily yeah. caused it. The fact that you look and go, ooh, this cake is looking like it's a little dry, you've already lost that game. Like they, they might have already aborted at that point. Um but, Yeah, I don't know. You I yeah, it's, I know. how would you know? I think it's, spraying for sure does cause it though. Cause I did fl- I've I've done flushes and I've I've left like little tiny pens and then I'm like, those are good, you know, and then a few days later they're still looking good. But then I'll spray the hell out of it and then they'll uh-huh. die. You know, but dude, I, I, so okay, so here I I hear you, and I have the same argument with Happy all the time too. Um, but in Mexico, in the cloud forest, it rains basically every fucking afternoon, and these spring take they, it doesn't make any sense. That's why to me, it's got to be related to the evaporative process or something in in the ground. Although even that doesn't make sense because. It, it rains, you know, in the afternoon a lot. Everything gets soaking fucking wet. Then it I dries know. up all night. Dude, I have thought about this what? so many times. I'm like, how does these big raindrops hitting it not abort them out there? I, but I don't know. I don't, I don't get it. Well, okay, so here's the next experiment. If it looks dry, although I don't imagine you're ever going to let it get that way. But instead of misting it, maybe you just fucking flood them. <laughs> yeah just just pour a so, goddamn bucket of water on them yeah yeah maybe maybe um, we're being too nice to them maybe they want to be roughed up a little bit i don't know <laughs> yeah. they like the abuse 
But I will tell you this, uh, in my Zaps channel, uh, I've got a couple guys that have flushed some pretty nice looking tubs. Maybe not Miko Zapotec level, but pretty close. Um, but then they'll do another run and they won't have that success. And then they'll do another run and they will have success. How, how have Zaps been for you over time? Do you have some that run better than others? Do you have certain, um, you know, maybe you got one from Cinco Palos, one you got from Texelo, ones you got from somewhere else. Are you finding that the different strains work better or are you finding run to run there's inconsistencies? How, how has that been for you? So like the first song I did was, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. I pronounce it Texelo, but I think it's like Cholo or something like that. Yeah. Um, that one I did, it, it yielded really well for me, but it was extremely slow. Um, and then the next one I did, I did Cinco Palos, which didn't yield as good for me, but it was incredibly fast. Like hmm. I pulled them out to go case them and they were already penning in less than a month. Nice. Whereas, you know, from the, the text law, I put it on, on substrate. And then, you know, a month to colonize that and then another month to pen. So it took over two months to pen and the Cinco Palos, it was less than a month coming off of the grain to pen. Nice. So, and then I, they fruited in what, two or three weeks? Yeah, it takes it takes two to three weeks yeah. um, for them to mature fully. That's what them. I mean. Isn't that crazy that they take and, and I they take a long time in the wild, too. I don't know if it's three weeks. But they're not fast growing mushrooms by any means. That's what I, I can't yeah. I can't get this whole like this folklore right now that is you can't miss them because they abort. I just I wanna figure that shit out because it does not make sense to me. It doesn't. Like, I've thought about I, it a lot of times. I know. <laughs> oh, all right. We're this year, some one of us, somebody out there, we're gonna figure this out. Just gotta get more people growing them. More people using, uh, so this is a good segue. Let's start talking about uh, the development of your, what you now call the dreamer tub um, or tubs, how that came about and uh, why, and you don't got to convince me why I think if, if, if you want to grow anything other than cubes, you probably should be thinking about a setup like this. Talk, talk me through how you came up with the idea, uh, why you came up with the idea and kind of how it's evolved. Um, well, so I started with the Marthas, you know, I, I seen on Goro Tech's videos, the, uh, the greenhouse tents and I had the one and I had it dialed in amazingly. And then I had two and they were dialed in amazingly. And then I wanted more. So then I put in four tents. I built the, uh, bulk humidifier system, which is like a, just a huge toe with like the, you know, UV sterilizer and their aerators and just all kinds of crap. I want. But like out. the four, you got like the four inch pipe coming off it, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that thing was the biggest pain in the ass I've ever dealt with in this whole field. Just having to clean that and make sure everything's right. And I couldn't get them dialed. I couldn't get the four dialed in just right off the one top exactly how I wanted it. You know, I'd have like perfect humidity here on this shelf and then it'd be dry as shit on this one. Yeah. And then. Yeah, it would be all messed up in this tent, and it's, and then the thing, the thing flooded on me twice, and I'm like, I am done with this, this thing. This is terrible. This is the worst. What do you, thing. what do you mean it flooded? Did you have like a float valve in there or something? No, I. Um, so what flooded? Uh, it went gonzo one day. It like wouldn't shut uh, off. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't have auto top off or anything like that on it. Okay. Um, it just it, the humidity just kept going and going and oh, going. So it just got so wet. Yeah. So okay. then it, it filled up my my have dog kennel trays that I put on the bottom of each right. tent, okay. and it was it was overflowing out of those, and it leaked out of my tent. My my whole tent I had to go. There was mold under it from that. Uh, it leaked underneath my tent all the way into the other side of the basement, and it did that to me twice in one month. And what? It went, no. Yeah. So wait. So what was the glitch? What glitch was it? The sensor or something? It, that was part of me not having the tent dialed in right. Right. So okay. it, it would be like dry in one spot and like wet, and like so the sensor was reading like a dry spot, 
but then the whole rest of the town would just be soaked all right. the hell. Right. Okay. Now that makes sense though, because the tent I had set up for my first zap run, um, I had that same problem and I ran pans in it with hit or miss success for the same reason. Because if you just have one humidity source blowing in, something's going to get soaking wet and something's going to be drier and something's going to be fairly unhappy. So that's why I'm like, fuck, man, I got to have like, what do I got to have a massive room where I can blow it in at the top with a fan next to it or something to help disperse it. So it's more evenly, but that sucks that I, I can't do that in my basement. So you came up with talk everybody through kind of your, your approach to, instead of going with this big massive fogger, what you did. Oh yeah, so the, the dreamer tub, yeah. I, I was like, well, what if I just do this in a toad? You know, and I could I could run separate toads. Um, so each toad, yeah, it has its own its own fan, it has its own humidity input, um, and then it has a drain valve. And if anything ever goes wrong and it doesn't want to shut off, it's all stuck within that tub. Right. So you're not gonna wake up to a nightmare or anything like that. Um and you know what's funny is I, I figured out I could run four of these tubs on one humidifier, and I decided for whatever reason I decided well I'll split the humidity directly at the humidifier. And this is the most important thing: if you split the humidity directly at the humidifier and not later on down the line, you're going to have consistent humidity in every single hose. Yep. And if I knew that back then when I had the tent. I would never have had these dreamer tubs built right? because I would have had my tents dialed in perfectly. If I known to separate it, then you know now I mean? that's smart. That's like for, you know, you know about packs in the home instead of running copper, people run packs and they run a home run setup, which is like, you got the water coming into the house in a manifold and everything gets a home run to it. So yep. everything comes off that one central manifold. So you don't have, Oh, bills in the shower. And then Susie tries to do the dishes and everybody's got, you know, everybody starts losing water pressure. That yeah. doesn't happen because you're coming off one manifold. So when I saw that, I was like, oh, that's smart. That I, I'm sure that equates into getting a consistent, even humidification in every tub because yeah. of that. that. That's very slick. And man, I just love, unless you were like a big bulk grower, like you just said, the containment for all the same reasons that people like growing in bags. If something goes wrong, it's easy to to deal with. It's the same thing for that, right? You you you're just containing a smaller amount of things in in each tub. But you can still I mean, I don't know what size tubs you're using, but it looks like you can easily get two or like if you had XLSA bags, it looks like you could get three, maybe four per tub in there, right? You can get four in there, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, that's a lot. Oh, yeah, you can fit a lot in there. You yeah, can so fit sixteen bags. Line. Yeah, in those four tubs, that's a that's a good amount of yeah exotic mushrooms. Yeah, three shoe boxes cool. in one fit perfectly. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 pretty dialed in. Yeah. All right, so let's look at um, I've got some pictures. Now, uh, of some subtropicalis. Now, was that grown in this tub setup? Um, the ones, all oh, those recent ones, actually, they are not. Those are grown okay. in just a regular old mono tub. Oh, cool. Okay. Well, I want to. I want to show off some fruits that are grown in, in in the dreamer. Well, first off, let's show the dreamer tub. Hold on, I forgot to do that. All right. So here we go. This is like a single setup. But this is what I'm talking about, guys, that I think is so, so smart. Off of this, and this is a pretty small, this isn't any massive um, humidifier. It's probably a single disc humidifier. But you have the, you created this little uh, plenum with four exhaust ports on it. It looks like you have three of them capped here. But I'm assuming if I buy this setup, then it gives me the option to add more down the road. So like if you were somebody who lived in a small house, you could have this setup. Let's say you move in three years and you got more space, you could add more manifold or you could add more tubes coming off of this manifold, right? Exactly. Yep. Nice. And then 
what else what am i seeing here so i see you got a little rack i'm assuming is that uh yeah. actually the rack i don't have i don't put those on there anymore you don't do that okay nope it was not necessary i found out but in the beginning you were just doing it i'm assuming so that the condensate had somewhere just to drip down there um yeah yeah but then yeah. if yeah if you got other tubs it, it's not even yeah you don't even need it no all right and then i see you got a fan with uh what i'm assuming is some sort of like merv cloth to filter the air going in right um i use that literally just to keep the fan clean otherwise you see like an old okay. pot fan it gets all clogged up yeah it gets gross it. yeah that's that's all that's that's not to keep the grow clean it's to keep the just the fan clean the fan okay yeah. it's all just right. cheap ac filter material and then you have that one tube going on to a T so that it's going in on both sides, which is kind of slick. Um, at one point, did you ever just have one and then decide you needed two or did just out of the gate? Did you just say, I think I need two spots um, for that air to come in? I'm trying to, I think, I think the very first one I built, I did one, but I also did the fan at the top of the chamber. Oh, okay. So we wouldn't allow that humidity to get to the other side of it. Right. So I'm thinking I might be able to get away with one again, and it's kind of something I'm playing around with at the moment. Okay. Cool. And then that other thing, that's like the sensor, the probe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, from the L Tech. And then what is this little spigot? Is that just like in case it flooded or something? You can you can drain it that way. That's just yeah. Um, if you leave it run for your for yeah, exactly. Just to drain it just it. fills up. Okay. You can leave right. your clays in there. You can just put a cup under there, lift the back up, and it drains right out. It's kind of nice, honestly. Nice. All right, and then so here's the full rack. Yeah. So yeah, man, you could have twelve shoe boxes. You could have sixteen XLSA bags. You could have probably eight good size pan cyan trays i mean it's a good amount of mushrooms in a small space with one little humidifier going now i'm gonna tell you my one issue so when i set up my my zap tent zaps were going good full colonization i was using alder wood chips everything's rocking and rolling i put it into fruiting conditions about Five days later, I, in my head, because I got ADHD, I, I thought I filled up the, the well with, with water, and I didn't. And I went, it, it could go two days without uh, having to be refilled. So I went two days, and it had been dry for three days, and they, they all stalled out and, and stopped. So I was like, God damn it. So my only issue is I would have to figure out a way to refill that chamber. That's that's my only. Oh, the humidifier. Yeah, I would. I gotta have a way where if I forget, huh? You mean like an auto top off? Yeah, I need I need something like that. I gotta figure something out like that. Really? Which you could do a little a little float valve, and what I'm thinking is maybe like a little reserve tank. I could sit on a shelf next to it, where I can fill it up myself. But in the event that my ADHD kicks in and I forget, it it you know, the, the valve will come down, it, it would fill up. That's yeah, you could thinking. easily put some kind of auto top off on that for like fish aquariums and stuff like that. Yeah, that's what I'm going to have to do. Those little humidifiers, actually, they'll last all week without being uh, filled up. Now, so, okay, this is what I'm curious about. Because I was filling up a huge gorilla tent, but in this case, you're filling up these smaller, it, like smaller enclosures right so they it's not using as much no so, yeah, you're, yeah you're saying like, you can go a week that's nice yeah I'll, i only fill those up really once a week yep all right very they're cool pretty, I'm, i want to say that they're i want to say they're four liter but i feel like i'm wrong they might that's not it's at least a gallon right looks like easily a gallon yeah i'd have to look on amazon but yeah they're they're not big. They're definitely not big. But yeah, they go all week, no problem. Nice. 
All right, so what, what, what should we look? How about these tamps? Are the tamps grown in these? I just want to show some. Okay, yeah, let's 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 do some pictures. All right, so we got tamponensis, and this is in those tubs that you guys saw on the shelves. All right, look at those sexy little motherfuckers right there. Ooh, 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 ooh. Look at that. That's how you that's how you know that relative humidity is on point. Look at just soaking wet. There we yeah, go. Yeah, they love it. They love down there. I have never um I have never had tamps. How are they? I never have either. I've never okay. ate them. Can't tell you. I'm curious. I think I think it was the Denver Psychedelic Cup just had um, some results out, and I, if I'm not mistaken, I think tamps were shown quite a, a, a good concentration of baocystin in them. So uh, oh. the, they're kind of in line with zapodecorum as far as having some of those other tryptamine alkaloids in it. Some I'm, I'm kind of interested in giving those a go. All right, let's take a look at. So these are. I don't. You, if you happen to remember, are these early pan grows or are these? These are all all the recent. All the ones I sent you are pretty recent. Recent, okay. Yeah, those those ones are TTPVI. I just did a run of those not long ago. Those oh, ones yeah. from there, those were the uh, B bar. They're a new species. I got nice. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I got those from a friend in Australia, and they're they're ridiculously strong. Nice. Bivar, did you say? Bivar, B B B bar. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. All right, what else can we look at here? All right, let's let's do some zaps. My favorites. All right, and these are these the Texelo or T Hello or. Yeah, those are the ones, yep. Nice. Oh yeah, dude. Those so are that uh, how those... how big in diameter is that top one up there? Is that like three inches? Um, probably at least, yeah. They get pretty big. Nice. Oh yeah, those look solid, dude. Those are so if you go back, that this is the water picture. This oh yeah, so it's literally <laughs> sitting in water. Yes, I wanted to try and kill them, and I, I didn't. In fact, they mature twice as fast as they usually do. All right. Blood tech. There it is. Yeah. They, they do not hate water. Now, so that might, it might actually be less about the stipes resisting a mudslide, and it just might resist breakdown in water by being a little more fibrous, too. Yeah. That's it. I don't know. Now, what's crazy, though, is... Just when you think you figured out where these things grow, then you find them somewhere else, and and it doesn't entirely make sense. But they definitely like a lot of fresh air, and they they like water. They like to be somewhat near water, whether it's a recent flood, where like some water floods down and everything's just drenched for a while, um, or they like to actually be by, somewhat by, little creeks or or rivers. That's how much water I drained out of that top. And that's just a nine by eleven cake pan. Wow, dude. Yeah, soaked. <laughs> Literally soaked. Oh, God. Dang it. You didn't you gotta prepare me for pictures like this. Yeah, so dude, that's Cinco Palos right there. I really like that shot. This these gills, I mean, I don't know if I've ever seen more perfect gills in my entire life. Those look nice. Nice, nice, nice. Damn. All right, dreamer tubs. Whether so, okay, you sell them, right? You sell them on spore swaps, but you also, um, I have heard, you know, if if somebody doesn't want to buy one and they're handy like me, they can build them. Um, I I'm definitely gonna have to get give one a go. I'm gonna probably be building something in between yours and one of my buddies uh, on Discord. He's got got a setup going too, but it's essentially the same. The idea is you're just you're trying to pipe in. Uh, humidified air into these tubs. I, I think it's a good call. I I, I commend you for being the first, to my knowledge, to bring a product that 
seems to be specifically catered to people who are not handy or don't have tools or don't have the time, but want to start growing exotics and need a setup like this. So that's, you know, you're, you're doing the Lord's work, dude. Some, some, some guy out there is definitely giving it a go because he can, he can buy a product like that from you. So that's great. All right. Now let me, let's pull up these just, because we only got a couple more photos to get through. We can do that and then get back to some questions. All right, so these are some very drippy, very sexy subtropicalis. Um, but you said this one's just in regular monotubs, so no humidification. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, man up from heaven, he uh, he told me, he's like, dude, just try running them in your monotubs like that. I did it all the time like that. I was like, no way. So I did it. Yeah, wow. they they did great. Just a regular old mono subtropical. And you color. didn't you didn't run run the subwet or anything. You ran them just like cubes. Uh no. So here's the only thing that I did different is I didn't I didn't fan them, but I did spray them with water at least once a day. Oh, uh, uh, okay. Subtropicalis are really like getting soaked, just like Zapticorum do. So I I, I I'm sure they would have did fine without spraying, but I wanted to spray them to try and get them you know better. And I nice. think it did help for sure. So, yeah. And then when I did spray, I would just go in there and just soak the place till water's pooling on the substrate. All right. Now, have you have you run these in your Dreamer tubs? And how does the flushes compare doing an old school misting once a day versus run it in your tubs? They turned out the same. Okay. So that does work. So that's cool for people if they want to try you know, try an exotic subtropicalis is within reach without having to do a big fancy setup. You just got to be able to get in that tub once a day and, and get it wet. All right. Yep. Nice. Those are the same ones. I forgot to give them light and that's why they're kind of going all wonky. They're looking for light. Oh, look at <laughs> that. Yeah. They, they have such different expressions. They didn't have light and they're way more yellow, but you can see them reaching for light. That's cool, man. All right. And then we have, I think, one more. All right. So these are, I mean, I don't know if it's got to be said, but these are black cap gnats. Uh, definitely yeah. looking nice. They're very, they're actually very blue in person, like super blue. Um, nice. Yeah. That's, that's the one thing that I'll always have a kind of a soft spot for me still is a, is the affinity uh natalenses they're like so close to being cubes or almost cubes but they're still not and i still really like them a lot damn look at that yep yeah man and those nets they sure pin on a plate dear god i mean you almost got to tell them to chill out it's ridiculous yeah yeah they're crazy nice all right, dude, some cool pictures, some cool fruit. Hard to believe you've been doing this for like a year, seriously. Um, but I like it. That's what I like to see. Um, I got a question for you. I saw um, a couple interesting posts on your Instagram. Um, not your normal, I would say, an atypical post. Talk to me a little bit about how uh, you found iNaturalist and uh how you use it for what you do with regards to trying to grow all these hard to grow rarely grown exotic mushrooms oh yeah yeah a naturalist um my friend wavy edge she showed me that along with mushroom observer i had no idea they existed um i started getting more into hunting and he was telling me about i naturalist and how i can kind of help get you in the right direction for identifying them and stuff like that and then and then I discovered the explore feature and I was like, wow, you can look at what everybody's finding all over the world. And, you know, some people put in their notes, like what the temperature was and, you know, where they were found and what they were doing and this and that. And I was like, well, these ones were found like this and it was found in this location. So I can just look up on Google and check out what the temperature range was, you know, think of elevation, stuff like that. And, you can generally get a sense of idea on how to fruit them, you know. That's the whole thing with that. It's, I agree. I mean, I think it's phenomenal. The amount of data that is there, especially for certain uh, 
you know, more appealing species, uh, a lot of the active species, there's a lot of data there. Uh, if it's somewhat common, if it's exceedingly rare, then maybe not so much. But yeah, you can see when they fruit and then you can go, okay, where they fruit, when they fruit, what's, you know, normal temperatures, what's normal rainfall around that time, what's the humidity tend to look like. You can extrapolate a lot of information to kind of inform how you might grow. So let's take that idea and talk me through um, temperature. All right. How have you been using INAT and how have you in your, you know, trying to figure things out for everything? Um, have, you, have you found that you can just have, you know, I feel like with cubes, everybody just kind of figures out eventually, eh, you know, as long as it's around 70 degrees, you're good. Have you found you can do that with exotics, or do you feel like you you gotta you gotta play with the the numbers a little bit? Um, yeah, you gotta play with the numbers a little bit for sure on some of them. Um, so like like uh, most of these cloud forest species, like the zapped corm and stuff, and I've never tried running it at like a hotter temperature or anything like that, but. You know, they run at room temperature. They're found fruiting at room temperature and stuff like that. Um, I haven't tried experimenting with different temperatures on them. You know, I just know pans coming from a hot place. I'm going to run them in a hot place. And right. That's all they're going to get. So that's still, I mean, just. This is something I deal with with people is they figure out how to grow a cube and then they want to try something else. And sometimes you have to say, you do know this is an entirely different species of mushroom, right? You might have to change a few things. Yeah. So what have been some of your, you're, you're growing more things. You're, you're growing pan science, tamps, subtrop, saps. Um, I think I saw where you doing caver lessons recently. Yeah. I care lessons. Those all aborted on me. But I got more going again now, yeah. But how are you, are you still just keeping it as simple as like, either I'm running at about 70, about room temp, or I'm going to run at about 80? Or have you really played around? Have you tried to run some stuff really hot to see what happens? Um, you got a cold fruiting room. So what uh, is that all about? I just, yeah. I mean, so you're, you got a cold fruiting room, man. So you got to be thinking about temperature in a way that the average grower is not. Yeah. Well, some, some species, the temperature swings that they want are crazy. So going back to iNaturalist, you can find these observations on there that people are finding. Like, let's say like um, psilocybe gandolfiana, for instance. I was trying to figure out how I'm going to run these things. So I messaged a couple people that found this species and um this this one uh this one girl she messaged me back and she's like i found these fruiting at 80 degrees and there was still snow on the ground <laughs> i'm like well how the hell am i gonna see that yeah 80 degrees and snow on the ground still like it was still melting and that was oh, a okay thing. yeah so so gandolfiana i've had it at room temperature for about a month maybe two months I'm not sure. I gotta look at it, um, and it's not doing anything. It's not. It's not overlaying, thankfully, but it's just kind of hanging out. You know, it looks happy. It looks healthy, but it doesn't want to grow yet. So, I'm deciding: should I put it in the cold or should I put it in the heat? You know, does it want the snow or does it want 80 degrees? I don't know, but it's getting one of them soon, and I'll see what happens with it. Well, and just the fact that you have that option that you can do that this right cool. now right. i'll tell you what even them even the the zaps and a lot of the cloud forest stuff um we've i've talked to quite a few people about the neohalapensis hymiae some of that stuff talking about some of the temperature swings day to night even in the cloud forest can be like easily 20 25 degree swings in temperature and and trying to figure out well should we be trying to recreate that how would we recreate that is is that a necessary part of the evaporative cycle for these mushrooms have you thought about trying to set a situation up where you could both heat a room and cool a room i've thought about it but man i don't want to <laughs> <laughs> well, i know it's like a nightmare yeah like yeah. It's, uh it's 
I'm running into the issue now where like species definitely want different parameters. So like I have like um, subaruginosa in my cold chamber, which I'm trying to fruit at like 45, like 40 to 50 degrees. Mm -hmm. And then I also want to run uh, Cerulea oryza, which fruits at like 15 to like 35 degrees. Can so your now, cold room get that cold? I've had my cold room down to 33 four degrees when i was testing it yeah okay cool yeah but shit you're in you're in the midwest if you time your grow right you don't <laughs> you're in you're in freaking wisconsin right you just yeah. time it right you could just toss them in the side porch that's true yep yeah. my back yeah, porch man. and that's probably what will happen with the cerulea rise it'll probably go on my back porch this winter yeah and it's my time frame's lining up good now with it so nice yeah, that, that'll be a fun one. Um, I know Happy's trying to grow that one, too, and hoping that, that he can work it to his advantage. Being yeah, would, in somewhere cold, for sure, should should help. I was just asking him about that the other day, yeah. Yeah, that. So, so this is, uh, in general, the fact that there are more and more people tackling more and more active species other than cubensis, is pretty awesome. Oh, yeah. If you think about how many people grow cubes versus how many people have grown anything else, it's an astronomic difference, right? It's astronomically different. You have hundreds of thousands of people growing cubes, if not at this point, maybe millions of people, even just in the U.S. growing cubes versus a thousand people ever have tried to grow some of these other things i mean so the minute we get we gotta you know we all gotta be ambassadors anybody that's grown anything other than a cubensis is playing a role right now in trying to build up that body of knowledge around the cultivation practice of all these things and you my friend are doing i mean above and beyond you are i mean a cold fruiting chamber yes Please, more of that. That that is great. I love that. And you, you can build those things a lot smaller too. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Wavy he he built one and he put it on wheels and like he could move it around. It's just he bought a shelf and he right. just built a shell around the shelf. So yep. it doesn't have to be huge, you know. I mean, it really doesn't. The one I'm gonna do is gonna be on a, a, a movable rack, so that if I want to take it somewhere else, yep, I can move it. If I want to just get at it from a different angle for some reason, I can do that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, and it's cool just seeing that you can do one, because it reminds me of if you've seen all these people building these bougie fruiting chambers for your kitchen counter, right? Like these $800 fruiting chambers. And you're like, who the fuck is buying these? But somebody's buying these because these companies keep popping up and they're insanely expensive. And for less money, you could be building something with way higher throughput, way easier to clean, way easier to maintain, last longer. Yeah, I, I think that's for, for people that got bit by the cultivation bug. I think that's that's the way to go for sure. Yeah. All right. Talk to me about this. I saw you recently spraying some spore prints with hydrogen peroxide. Talk yeah. About that. Yeah. So I got, I got a whole bunch. I ordered just a ton of prints from Raj. Um, uh, he's a Irish, uh, mushroom hunter in Mexico. Oh, okay. I got just a ton and yeah, I, I use hydrogen peroxide big time to clean up spores. Um, I got that idea from Moon Daddy, um, and it works. It works crazy good, for sure. Cool, man. And um, even just like swabbing fruits and stuff, I've been, I've been spraying my fruits with hydrogen peroxide before swabbing for spores for almost as long as I've been growing, and I've never had any issues with it. So, and they just come out. Oh, clean. like your your fruit from a tub. That and spores taking spores to agar. I do it both ways. Yep. Yeah. So wild, anything. I found some luteus the other day. I sprayed those before swabbing, and yep. 
Now, see, I've always just sprayed with isopropyl 70%. I never even thought about spraying with hydrogen peroxide, but I think it kills shit quicker because the I think the isopropyl has to be wet for a certain amount of time, right? Um, I've heard it the other way around. I've heard isopropyl alcohol um, works faster than hydrogen peroxide. But I'll tell you this. You can spray, like take your hands and spray one hand with isopropyl and one hand with hydrogen peroxide and let it sit for like a minute and dunk each hand in a agar dish, close them up and seal them. And I guarantee you the hydrogen peroxide dish is going to be clean. Yeah. So that's my understanding because um, when we, in healthcare, when we spray stuff down, there's wet times are a big deal for, for a, a lot of chemicals. And my understanding with the 70% uh, isopropyl, and the reason you go 70% not 90% is because it has to have that open wet time. Um, it has to actually dry naturally in order for it to, to kill the bacteria. Whereas my understanding with hydrogen peroxide is pretty much it touches it and it kills it. So that doesn't surprise me. I just never thought about doing it, but I love it, man. I'm, I'm definitely going to give that shit a try. Now, I got one question, though. I saw you literally fucking spray a foil sheet of prints. Yeah. How thick are those prints? Because in my head, I'm thinking if I had a light print, would I just kill all those spores? Like, does it matter how thick the lay it of it, it won't kill the spores? It won't kill them at all for sure. Really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Dude, I I mean, I know you've been doing it, so I got no reason not to believe you. Um, yeah. I just never thought about it. I, I thought for sure it'd kill them. Very cool. I'm gonna try it. No, I yeah. guess I probably got about 30 dishes going from Ra from uh Raj's spores and I didn't kill any nice. of them. Some awesome, of them are dude. delicate species. Very cool. Yeah, I mean that's the only thing I fucking hate about wild prints is they're a pain in the ass to clean up. So right. dude, if any idea, right? I'm listening. I'm I'm not skeptical. I'm I'm looking for a way to make that process easier. So hell I yes. Like I, I also use it in my plate work when I'm cleaning up my plates themselves. I'll use it. Like you just lightly mist the plate itself? Yeah. So let's say I have a nice, nice germination plate with like a big old wad of trichoderma on it. I'll, I'll open that dish up. I'll give it a nice spray. I'll close it for, you know, a few minutes wow. and I'll go back in there, take my transfer wedge. I'll spray my transfer wedge, lay it on the new dish. And a lot of times I can get away from trike and just one transfer doing that. What the fuck? <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to lie. It, unless it's wild shit, I'm, I'm not usually getting anything, but dude, I got, I got, a, I got an astacorum swab right now that I could, I used the one swab. I could not clean that shit up. So we're, we're going for round two now have you ever taken the swab do you do you ever spray the swab um if i have only if you only have one swab left i would definitely cut a chunk out of it yeah yeah so i i cut an x on the top and then a little circle around the x i pull it mm -hmm. yep. out but yeah i'll if i if i have several swabs yeah i'll spray the whole damn swab and I'll let it sit there for a couple minutes. So you will. Okay. The, and now how saturated are you getting that thing? I'll get it soaked. Really? Yeah. Fuck. I love <laughs> this. Okay. I'm I'm doing it. I'm I'm all in. I you know, in the beginning of my mycology journey, at some point I bought like three huge bottles of hydrogen peroxide. And I still got two of them because I, I don't use it that much. So now you got got me a reason to to give it a try. I like it. I better, I go through them like crazy. Dude, I don't even use isopropyl like at all anymore. Like even prepping my workstation, I only use hydrogen peroxide. That's all I use. Really? No yeah. shit. See, I've been, I use, I got a hypochlorous acid generator. So I use that and it's, I also love that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, man, I'm, I'm up for trying. I like to try shit, I'll try something else, uh, especially for, for prints. This, I don't know. In my head, I just was always thinking I can't just spray a bunch of chemicals all over this stuff. But fuck it. I'm yeah, ready yeah. to do it. <laughs> I'm going to dunk that shit and go for it. 
I haven't noticed any mutants or anything. I've I've sprayed fruits, took spores, grew out those spores and sprayed them again. I, I haven't noticed anything wrong, any mutations, anything. So Yeah, I don't man, I never even thought of it as a mutagen. I just thought like, oh, it's gotta just kill all these spores, but clearly it's not. No. I love it. Not. All right, guys. You got stuff to go try if you guys are messing with some wild, you know, prints from from the out great outdoors grab, grab you a misting bottle of uh hydrogen peroxide and go to town and he's got a recent video you can watch on his instagram um where he's demonstrating this so yeah dude i gotta give that a try that that's that that that's too enticing not do you know how many sometimes i have to do like three transfers or i have to let it grow out I got to take a chunk off because there's contamination everywhere. I found one good spot. I let that grow out. Then I trench it. And then usually I'm good. But that that compared to one transfer and I'm good. Yeah, that's that's the life I'm trying to live right there. Right. But now if I do transfer for from a contaminated plate, I don't care if that that new plate looks 100 percent clean. I'm going to transfer one more time from it. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but if you can get it clean in one transfer, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I like that. Cool, man. Um, all right, so so I looked on your uh, Sports Wabs page. Man, you got shit I never even heard of, dude. Never even heard of some of these. You got so many cool things. If you guys are looking, if you guys got the bug that Pheno Dreamers does which is the I got to catch them all bug. Um, and you want exotics, you can definitely go check his stuff out. He's got all sorts of weird, rare shit I never saw before. Um, yeah. Plenty that I have. I'm but... I'm actually... What's that? Unfortunately, said, unfortunately I'm actually, I just, unfortunately, I just went into a vacation mode. So okay. I'm going on vacation next week. I'll be, I won't be out of vacation mode till like almost the end of the month. So that's the only. That's fine, that. dude. Yeah. So this is everybody can be salivating and thinking and planning and plotting what ones they want to get. Yes. All right. So I got for. Let me ask you this. I've grown cubes. Maybe I've grown pants, and I want to try something else. What's the first exotic you would recommend that I try? Rabbit quorum all day. Even before pans, runs up to quorum. Okay. I like yeah. it. Sounds good. Well, dude, I cannot wait to get my, my setup going. Um, I won't bug you on your vacation, but but I'm I might have a few questions for you uh later about uh sourcing a couple parts. We'll see. Um but if you guys want to get set up like this and you don't want to build something, you guys can go to Sports Swabs and uh go to Fino Dreamers uh page. And he's got his dreamer tub set up there. Uh, you can check that out. Check out all his genetics. And do you have a Discord? I know you got an Instagram, which is just Fino underscore Dreamers. Um, but but are you on any of the other social medias? Um, I have Discord. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, it should be Fino underscore Dreamers or okay something like that. I did join your 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 channel. Cool. Okay. Great, man. All right, dude. Well, this was fun. We'll have to do it again because, um, you know, you got all these projects going. So if if you you have some sort of revelation, some sort of amazing new news, like I just figured out how to grow this. And to my knowledge, nobody's grown it or hardly anybody's grown it. Or I think I figured out a step that no one's figured out. Even if you want to just do a little check in on something, you just let me know. Um this is exactly, I'm, I'm all about people like you who are putting the time, energy, and money into figuring out how to cultivate stuff that nobody's cultivating. I think it's great. Yeah, for sure. Cool, man. Well, uh, I don't know where you're going on vacation, but I hope it's warm, and I hope there's no hurricanes there. <laughs> It'll be one of those for sure. <laughs> These days, uh, that's that's a concern. Hopefully, nowhere with hurricanes. Yeah, it's it's looking really scary for them. I, I hope Bro. It's right down there. Yeah. Now it does look like it's kind of de-escalating a little bit, so that's good. But um, it's still going to be a hot mess down there for sure. 
yeah. So now we got two hot messes to, yeah. Welcome to the world of global warming. The hurricanes are only going to get worse. The oh, uh, the yeah. storms yeah. only going to get worse. Yep, strap wow. in every That's year. That's why I'm going to stay right here in the Midwest. Yeah. You don't want to move to Antarctica? They have like five square miles of green space. Uh, hey, they that might be the only place there's some new real estate here popping up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, dude. All right, man. Well, this was fun. Keep growing. Uh, love your enthusiasm. Love your passion. Love your complete obsession with exotics. I think it's awesome. Um, everybody watching, go go check out his uh, Sports Wives page. See what he's got. Follow him on Instagram. You can keep up with uh, all his recent experiments and grows and, and sexy fruit picks and all that stuff. And, you know, the occasional gill porn, which is always my favorite. Yeah. All right, man. Thank you uh, for your time. I'll let you get to bed. Absolutely, man. Thank you for having me. All right, guys. That was Fino Dreamers, uh, the one and only based on Instagram and, and I guess the shroomery. All right. You know, I guess if, if you want these unique uh, genetics, you got to go somewhere to get them. So um, we're going to do something we don't do all the time here. Shout out to the shroomery. Definitely shout out to wavy edge. Um, guys like that doing a lot of cool stuff. So yeah, shout out to wavy edge. Shout out to Fino dreamers. Um, I am 100% uh, committed to, getting into these exotics, man, Get, getting them figured out, getting them uh, text figured out for them. Uh, my buddy Happy's all about it. Fino Dreamers, Jack Cyan. Uh, and, and then, uh, you know, a lot of guys working in stealthy secrecy on on, on shroomery trying to figure all this stuff out. So amen and thank you to, to all the people figuring out how to grow stuff other than cubes. Um, I think that might be the future. If you've uh, ever had... Uh, an active mushroom other than a cubensis, uh, you know, there's something there. There's something to it a lot of times. So anyway, uh, yeah, hopefully we can keep having more people on like Fino Dreamers, like Happy Hyphae, like Jack Cyan, like Mac Reddy. Guys uh, doing a lot of cool stuff, growing exotics. So anyway, guys, uh, until next week, go grow some mushrooms. Mm -hmm.